Hey, welcome everyone to this episode of the Bible study on 1 Corinthians. I'm joined by Dina. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, good. Very good indeed. And we're loving this book, aren't we? Amen. Yeah, yeah. that's great. Uh, you probably heard me say this before, but I'm going to repeat it. Pastor Ray said this once. If Romans is the most important book, guess what? This is the most relevant book. And what we've been able to do in the course of just teaching this is highlight so many issues to do with human nature that are relevant in every single age. What we've been trying to do is really dive into what did it mean for the people who were hearing it there and then, and what does it mean for us here and now today? So in this episode, we're dealing with the second half of 1 Corinthians chapter 14. And let me help you here with the context. Context is so important. We're talking about worship in the early church. This is why this book is so valuable. We know from the book of Acts that the early church worshiped we're not quite sure what they did. First Corinthians gives us a window to that. Chapter 11, we discover uh, stuff about communion. And then in chapter 12, Paul dives into spiritual gifts. This was a church that loved their spiritual gifts, but they didn't love each other. They loved the limelight. They loved standing up like with long messages and tongues. They were having great public personal devotional times. They were getting edified, but no one else was. I think it's really important for us to highlight this here. Paul does not have a problem with spiritual gifts. Even though he spends chapter 12 and chapter 14 talking about them and explaining how we should use them, he loves spiritual gifts. And he said to the church, if you would only use love in chapter 13, you would actually operate with these gifts more. But it's interesting that in chapter 13, he said, you got to start loving each other. Now from chapter 12, you know what they are, but I have to give you some details in chapter 14. So on the last episode, uh, my great colleague here, Dina, sat with Kurt and they went through the operation of prophecy, tongues, and interpretation and how beneficial they are. And this is a really cool thing. Speaking in tongues is beneficial for the individual. It builds them really up, but prophecy is so much better for the church. And what Paul wants is everyone to benefit. So if you're a tongue speaker, he says, stay at home and knock yourself out. Have an incredible time or make sure there's a person with the gift of interpretation. But actually he goes, let's push it further. Just prophesy. I would love it that you all prophesy. And then he goes into more detail here from, from verse 26 to the end of the chapter. Some really cool insights again. I want you to, while, while Dina is teaching here, just watch out of how the early church worship. And again, before Dina jumps in, context is important. Do not think American megachurch. Don't think your Southern Baptist church, okay? What you got to think here is a city of 50 to 60,000 people, probably a congregation of 100 people, but divided into house churches. And that was radical in the city of Corinth that was just had populated with temples. People were going to these temples and suddenly the temples are appearing in homes. The temples are people. And these people are no longer looking at idols, but by faith, they are connecting with the living God. And this is what I love about 1 Corinthians. Everyone, it's so important we get this. In our day today, God is alive. His spirit is real. He's active in the church. He works through the priesthood of all believers. There's, there's no big celebrities here, but you know what? God is in his church and he acts. So Dina, it's over to you. Come on, let's start going through the text today. Perfect, okay. One through verse 25, all about the proper use of tongues and prophecy. Now Paul gets really practical in his instructions. So picking up verse 26. What then, brothers? Now it's interesting to note this word brothers, it's brothers and sisters, it's that masculine plural. So he's talking to all members of the body. What then, brothers? When you come together, each one has a hymn, a lesson, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Let all things be done for building up. That is the gold standard. According to Paul, that is the overarching theme of whether or not you should speak, whether or not you should use your gift in that setting. It should be done for the purpose of building one another up. Verse 27, if any speak in a tongue, let there be only two or at most three. 
and each in turn and let someone interpret. So we can kind of summarize, picking up the pieces from this passage, that what was happening is chaos. People were talking over one another. One person would speak in a tongue, and then another person would speak in a tongue, and there would be all of these people speaking at once over each other. And so what Paul is trying to do is he's trying to introduce regulations to bring about order. So he says, just let one or maybe two or at most three each in turn so that they're not speaking over one another. And let someone interpret. But if there is no one to interpret, let each of them keep silent in church and speak to himself and to God. So the point here is from everything that Paul has said in the preceding part of this chapter, he's saying the purpose of a church service is to build one another up. And when you're speaking in a tongue and there's no interpreter, you're not doing anything that's edifying another believer. And in fact, if an unbeliever comes in, they're gonna be really confused. So if you don't have an interpreter there, go ahead and stay silent. Verse 29, let two or three prophets speak and let the others weigh what is said. So there is a little bit of debate back and forth. So is Paul saying, okay, at the most three people should speak in tongues because he has that at the most. And then does that rule apply for the prophets as well? A lot of scholars would say it seems like he is putting a limit on how many people in tongues should speak one after another, but more he's just saying for the prophets, go ahead and have a few people speak. It's really unclear, and I think the overarching um, idea behind this chapter isn't that Paul is giving an exact uh, PCO, a planning center, if you're a worship pastor or a teaching pastor. He's, he's not giving a PCO. He's not giving the exact outline and plan. He's just giving some overarching principles for the service. So it goes on to verse 30. If a revelation is made to another sitting there, let the first be silent. For you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all be encouraged. And what I find fascinating about that verse is I, I can't even imagine the lowering of ego that must happen in order for a church to operate in this way. Can you imagine, Andrew, if all of a sudden someone raises their hand at Bayside and says, actually, Pastor Andrew, I think I have a word from the Lord in that <laughs> moment. Now, obviously, our churches, we don't operate in this way because you've done the mm -hmm. preparation process, you've examined the scriptures, and so you have the platform to share that particular week. And yes. next week, it might be Kurt or someone yeah. else. But can you imagine the lowering of the ego that must have happened in this context for someone to say, okay, I, I'll yield the floor. If God has spoken to you, well, I trust that the spirit of God is inside of you. And so I'll yield the floor to you to speak. The amount of ego that must have been yes. absent from that church in order for this to actually operate correctly. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's a fascinating thought of, of the dynamics. And I think that Paul, as you said, he's trying to be really practical. Mm -hmm. so, so you're imagining like this uh, first century living room, whatever, yes. I don't, Ikea furniture, you know, I'm sure they had it back then. <laughs> Everyone's sitting around and, and, and just the dynamic. However, I think as well, there must have been times when they gathered Acts chapter two in the temple. They weren't speaking in tongues. I've got an interpretation. They right. couldn't hear it. Mm -hmm. This was the intimate, This for me, this is like groups in a church. Like small groups. They come mm -hmm. together and there's this beautiful interaction. But as you know, You've had people over at your house and you're delighted to have them, but they tend to take over sometimes. Mm -hmm. Not anyone we know, obviously. Oh, yeah. I've heard people talk about this, but uh, but they, they, they can some domineer sometimes mm -hmm. in conversation. But I love what you're saying. There's moments of where people give way mm -hmm. at this moment in time. We're maybe jumping slightly ahead, but it does bring back a memory, Dina, yeah. at one time of, I was told about just about a century ago, a church in the North of England, the two sisters started and it grew. I mean, it grew to over a thousand people. And when there was a, like either three messages in tongues or three prophecies, one of them would stand up and go, I'm going to pray and formally close this service. <laughs> they would just be done. <laughs> so it was like legalistic, their approach to it. So that they could have then another service and more messages of tongues and prophecy. I don't think that's what Paul's trying to do here. So amazing. So they would actually formally close. Formally the, close the service. take a five minute break and come back. So that we can come back and have oh more tongues goodness. and more prophecy. I love the way they're trying to be eager to do it. Yeah. I, I think I think what Paul is uh, talking about here is actually your ability to retain the moment of revelation. If you're Absolutely. getting like 
oh, five, six words from the Lord. It's just like, it's overindulgence and we're losing the point. That's so good. That's amazing. I love that. And and adding to that idea that Paul isn't really giving a list of this is exactly how it needs to go is one thing that's not mentioned in here is reading scripture. Yes. And that's obviously a key critical part of a church service. Yeah. And that's, that's what we found our church services on today. So against that idea that this is an exact order of service for all time, scripture reading is not even including here, included here. Paul is just giving some instructions mm. that are particularly important for the church in Corinth because things have gotten out of hand. Yep. So he says in verse 31, for you can all prophesy one by one so that all may learn and all be encouraged. And the spirits of prophets are subject mm, right. to prophets. So there's no, God compels me to say this. The way that God operates in the giving of the gifts is he gives the gifts, but the gifts are under the control and the exercise of the person that they're given to. So you can choose not to exercise a gift. You can choose when to say something. You can choose when to speak in that tongue, when to use your gift of interpretation. And then the most important point of this entire passage, for God is not a God of confusion, but of peace. This is the main theological theme. And the main idea here is that the way we express ourselves in worship of God should reflect the character of the God that we worship. So just as God is a holy God, our worship must represent that holiness. Because God is a God of peace, not of chaos, our worship too should be one that promotes order and peace rather than division. So that is the main theological point here. Now we're diving into the controversy. And the next few verses, there are a lot of reasons that they're controversial. And I, I can say, I'm going to read them and, and it'll be immediately obvious why they're controversial. So it says this. It says, picking up in verse 34, um, quick, quick little, quick little side note. I come from a Baptist past and I come from a generation that had six preachers before me. And one of those preachers was a woman. And so my grandfather, he wrote a book called Mama Was a Preacher. And so there's this legacy inside my family of women preaching. And I wanna to speak to everyone here. As we read these verses, I wanna be so clear that God is a God who loves women. Going all the way back to the first time that women are mentioned in Bible, in the Bible, it's Genesis 1 where God creates them male and female. And then Genesis 2, we get this beautiful picture of how women are created. And it is so clear that women are an integral part of God's plan from the very beginning. God loves women. He takes care of them. He has a place for us in his plan. Now, the different ways that we work out our exact roles and our proper way to exercise the gifts that he gives us to build up the church, that's the subject of controversy. What is not controversial at all is that God is extremely pro-women and loving of women and has a place for them in his plan. Okay, so for God is not a God of confusion, but a God of peace. So then it goes on to say, as in all the churches of the saints. Now that is a matter of a little bit of controversy. Some translations connect that phrase, as in all the churches of the saints, with the preceding point about God being a God of peace and order. And then some translations connect it with the following verses. So we'll dive into that controversy in a moment. Verse 34, the women should keep silent in the churches for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission as the law also says. If there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame it, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. We're going to pick back up in 36, but I think those verses, as they are the center of a lot of controversy around 1 Corinthians 14, they deserve a moment of pause as we examine the way different Bible scholars approach those verses. So first and foremost, there's a little bit of controversy about whether that clause, as in all the churches of the saints, should be connected to the preceding verses or the following verses. There's a few different reasons people would connect it to the preceding verses. Um, first is that it's actually a really awkward grammatical construct to say, 
as in all the churches of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches. So it's a very unpalling expression to use churches twice and the whole sentence structure doesn't sound quite correct. So that's one point where people would connect it with the preceding verses about God being a God of order. On the other hand, a lot of people have argued that the right position for these is actually to connect it to the principle about women keeping silent because it's kind of awkward to connect as in all the churches of the saints to a foundational principle about God's character. It almost is sort of, if, if we take that approach, it's like Paul is saying that this principle of who God is is dependent on the practice of the churches. So that itself seems like a little bit of an awkward construction. And so that's one of the reasons there's a little bit of a discrepancy about where you might find that verse, whether there's a comma in one spot or a period in another. The way that the Greek text appears, it's in all capitals and there's no punctuation. Here's the thing. No central doctrine of Christianity is in any way compromised no matter where you put this comma, no matter where you put this sentence. It does a little bit affect our interpretation of these verses and I'll give you some options of interpretation, but I wanted to open your eyes to the fact that there's a little bit of controversy. So for instance, Andrew, if you pull up the NASB, Mm -hmm. which tends to be a little bit more word for word. Mm -hmm. And then you pull up the ESV, which is a little bit less word for word, a little bit more phrase for phrase. They put this in different spaces. NASB word for word, it connects it with the God is a God of peace. Mm -hmm. ESV connects it with let the women be silent. Yes. So then you go to the NIV, which is a little bit more phrase to phrase. Uh -huh. Now you would assume based on the NIV being a completely opposite approach to the NASB, uh, phrase for phrase as opposed to word for word, that the NIV would also connect it with the women. Rather, they take the side of the NASB. So this is just one of those areas where <laughs> grammatically it's really yes. hard to interpret whether it belongs with the idea that God is a God of order, or God is a God of peace, or whether the women should be silent. So that's the first controversy in this verse. I think I maybe want to add in here as well for everybody that's watching this right now is that you can hear from what Dina is saying that people, not in like a legalistic, you know, myopic way, stingy, um, you know, uh, begrudgingly looking over the scriptures, trying to prove their point. I actually think people labor over this. And people come out of out of this with different interpretations. Mm -hmm. And it's not just this passage here with uh, regarding women. It sometimes is regarding tongues and prophecy. And this is what's really important is that as believers, and as we go on to talk about this, is that we learn to respect one another, even though it might be, we might be come out with um, completely different views and practices on this. But I think what I love what Dina's doing here is she's going, this is complicated. We are taking an ancient language that we don't speak today and we're trying to get the best translations and the best practices possible. Okay, just wanted to throw that in. I love that. And and to me, this is an encouraging process. Yeah. I think there there may be some listeners who are turned off by this process and you, um, this makes you feel worried about whether the text that we have, um, whether it's the original text, to me, it does the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. To me, it says, I can actually look at the reason everyone translated it this way as opposed to this way. I can examine that process for myself and, and know that God didn't just preserve his word, but he also preserved the process mm -hmm. for me, but me to be able to understand. So to me, it's an encouraging thing yes. to know the complexities of the text. So as in, all, as in all the church of the saints, the women should keep silent in the churches. There's honestly, there's three different approaches um, to summarize to this, to this passage. First is that these verses aren't authentic. There are a lot of scholars that actually believe that these verses are not um, Pauline, mm -hmm. that Paul did not write them. Uh, the reason why is that even though every manuscript includes these verses, the placement of these verses appears in different areas. Mm -hmm. So for some, they, they appear in the place that the ESV puts them, it appears at verse 34. In most manuscripts, actually, it appears in verse 40. Now, I could go into the reasons the ESV put it in the 30 in 34, but I won't I won't dive into that. What you need to know is that there's a lot of discrepancy among the manuscripts about the placement of these verses. So 
a lot of people have come to the conclusion that scribes actually inserted this as commentary about what was the common accepted practices of the churches that day. It's not something that Paul said, and so therefore it shouldn't be included in the canon of scripture, but it's an interesting note for us. And so that's one option. Against this, the challenge with this view is that every single manuscript we have actually includes these verses. We can debate about the right place to put mm. them, but it appears that they are authentic to Paul because they are placed um, in some place in this chapter. So that's the first option. These verses aren't authentic. The second option is that these verses limit a type of speech, specifically disruptive speech. And, and the main reason someone would take this approach is they go back all the way to 1 Corinthians 11 and they say, whenever there's a controversy, Andrew, it's always the, the worst ones are Bible versus Bible. Mm -hmm. It's not Bible versus what Dina, what does Dina believe? It's not Bible versus what does culture believe? It's Bible <laughs> says this and the Bible says this and bringing those together that's challenging. So 1 Corinthians 11 appears to be talking about gatherings for worship and it refers to women prophesying mm -hmm. and it refers to them prophesying and that is a word that can only be used for a woman speaking out loud mm -hmm. in a church setting and so in order to preserve 1 Corinthians 11 they interpret 1 Corinthians 14 as not limiting all women prophesying but to a specific type of a woman speaking and that is disruptive speech so it, it could be disruptive speech or even some say that women were prohibited from weighing in on whether or not the prophecy was from god or not that that was supposed to be an office that was reserved for the elders of the church which is for some a distinctly male office so the challenge with that view, it, it kind of explains the apparent contradiction between chapter 11 and mm -hmm. chapter 14, but a possible challenge with that view is it seems to go beyond the text. It, there, there's, it, there's extra biblical reasons to interpret the word that way as opposed to simply drawing it out from the meaning of the text. So that's the challenge of interpreting it that way. And last but not least is is what may be called the, the simple reading, the simple, easy reading, which is that these verses limit women from speaking in the office of teaching when the church is gathered. So this wouldn't be like if you and I were talking that I wasn't permitted to speak. Mm -hmm. It was talking about when the church is gathered together for worship as an official service, a woman should not preach in that setting. and. There's a lot of great reasons to believe that view. Um, one that is obvious is that that seems to be exactly what the verse is saying. I do not permit a woman to teach. Let the women be silent. However, there is a challenge with that view, and it, it seems to completely side with the 1 Corinthians 14 and completely not take into account the 1 Corinthians 11 passage where Paul talks about women prophesying, and in fact, other passages in Scripture that refer to women having the gift of prophecy. So that's a challenge with that view. So, Andrew, what are we to do? What are we to do? Well, what I, are we I, to do? Yeah, I think as well, it's um, the next verses, then it says, if they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. And some of the commentators that have been reading on this, and again, what you highlighted there was the disruptive nature mm -hmm of what they were doing. So the way they were going about it, it mm -hmm. was like their husband was maybe trying to prophesy or teach or something. And then that small room were, were, were domineering and mm -hmm. taking over and undermining their husband. Right. The culture of the day, it was like a like a no-no to do that. So I think as well that verse 35, what do you think of that, Dina? Verse 35 is an indication, definitely that's some of the stuff that I read on this and I've studied over the years. They, people point a 35 in, there's a way to speak, don't do it there. Don't hijack the service. Do it at home. Yes. I think that that's a completely fair interpretation. Yes. That would fall into that second camp of yes. saying that these verses are not referring to a woman prophesying in any way in a church, but really just a type of speech, specifically disruptive speech. Um, honestly, I fall into that second camp, as yeah. you probably guess. Yes. But I, by I, virtue of you speaking by right now. By the virtue of me speaking right now. I fall into that second camp, but I, I honestly, I have great appreciation for all three views. And what I love about all three views is that they have a high view of scripture. Mm -hmm. I think what's not up for grabs here is one, submission to Christ, mm -hmm. and two, submission to others. 
and three, submission to the word. I think those are the main things that we have to be concerned with in this passage. Are we submitted to Christ? I, as someone that believes that I have the gift of being able to, to speak the words of scripture to the church, am I submitted to Christ in that? If he said, Dina, you're not allowed to speak to the church, would my answer be, yes, Lord, I submit. If the answer is no, then there's a problem in my heart that I have to correct. Second, am I submitted to others? Am mm -hmm. I submitted to my church pastors yes. and their theological understanding? Am I submitted to my husband and his understanding of these passages? Am I submitted to the authorities in my life, my small group participants, those that keep me accountable? Is there mutual submission among other church leaders and myself? And third, am I, am I submitted to the word of God? Mm -hmm. If I come to the conclusion that scripture teaches something, am I willing to pick up everything that I have lay it on the altar and go a different way because the Bible says so. So I think those are the three main things that we have to keep in mind here. And I think whatever, honestly, I, I just wanna say, yeah. it, whatever interpretation you land with, I think keep your view of Christ high, keep your view of others high, and keep your view of scripture sure, high. Because even if it turns out that we take a very strict view of whether or not women should be allowed to speak in a church service, I think that there is absolutely the clear scope of scripture is that when women are loved by God, yeah. they are called by God, and they're commanded by God to use their gifts to edify the church. So that in 1 Corinthians 14 is not up for grabs. Yeah. The appropriate exercise yeah. of that gift, that is really where we have to sort yeah. in and see that this is an important verse but it's not a simple verse. Mm -hmm. So I would, I would just end with that caution and then we should dive into verse 36. Can I can I just say something on the whole submission authority yeah, thing? Yeah, absolutely. I, and uh, I've heard some guys in the past like almost use this as a, you know something to beat people with in that way. And I go, what you've just described reg as a female regarding, you know, I'm in submission, I'm under authority. I would say it goes exactly the same for me. Mm -hmm. At no point ever in my life towards a, a female or towards a male member of the church going, I am the authority. Mm -hmm. If I ever have to rise up to that level or use that language, do you know what? I've lost already. Mm -hmm. We're all mutually submissive, sub in, in submission one to another. And I think that's really important. Mm -hmm. And we've had some very unhealthy church models um, created by men here in the United States that have led to so much harm for people in the church mm -hmm. as they thought they were God's anointed and the only one. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why here at Bayside, have we got it all right? No, but that's why we try to do team ministry, mm -hmm. whether guys or girls, that we're all working together. There's not one of us has a monopoly on the voice of God or on, on, on what we believe is to be right. We work together in an atmosphere of submission. I think that's really important. I think for me as well, Dina, I, we were always taught, if you want to try and prove anything from scripture, quote as little of it as possible. Mm -hmm. And I think this is one passage mm -hmm. that talks about women. But if we look at the New Testament, Old Testament as well, for me, the whole sweep of scripture points towards Paul as well, mm -hmm. points towards um, the uh, incredible value that women have in leading and teaching in the church. Mm -hmm. I think he speaks very specifically mm -hmm. to some key texts in, 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 in Timothy and here in 1 Corinthians where he has to deal with a certain issue within the church. But I think we've got to keep the whole sweep of scripture. And for me, that points towards women being valued, women having a deep purpose, and women having an incredible role of leading and communicating truth in the church. It's so good. So to wrap it all up in summary for these challenging verses, uh, I caution you against anyone who says this is, this is a no-brainer passage. <laughs> This is something that if you have a different view, you are in clear violation of scripture. What I think you need to understand is this is a, a very complex passage. It's complex in whether it's authentic, it's complex in whether it is um, in the right place, and it is complex in its interpretation. We shouldn't shy away from complex issues. Rather, we can use each other, we can use other scriptures, and we can use the Spirit of God himself to interpret these properly. So. With that,
Let's go back to verse 36. Was it from you that the word of God came? Or are you the only ones it has reached? Paul is using his signature sarcasm and really just digging at the Corinthians and saying, uh, the fact that I even have to correct you in these issues is very frustrating. Are you the only ones it has reached? If anyone thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. Mm -hmm. So what Paul is saying is what I have presented to you in this whole chapter, this whole segment on gifts, tongues, prophecy, women speaking, this is a command from the Lord. And if you do not recognize it, then you are not in agreement with the tradition of scripture and the teaching of the other apostles. So my brothers, wrap up to this text, mm -hmm. earnestly desire to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but all things should be done decently and in order. And again, why? What is the purpose? So that the church of Christ may be built up. So with that, uh, this is an amazing passage. Oh, Let's yeah. dive in. What do you have for us in the way of theology? <laughs> well, well, what I think, obviously, the, the key things is pneumatology. What is the work of the Spirit within the life of the church? And I said this at the beginning of context. So important, everybody. Uh, Dina, and I look at this, the church is alive. Services should be exciting. People shouldn't be coming as spectators. People should be turning up like with deep spiritual resources inside of their lives. You know, if you even look back to at the beginning of chapter 14, it says, follow the way of love. What a beautiful thing on the back of 13. And eagerly desire the gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. You people should be spiritual people. Back to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, you used to follow mute idols. God was deaf and God was, he was silent. He wasn't saying anything to you. Now God is alive and he's actually speaking through you. So I love the idea of within where pneumatology meets ecclesiology. So it's not just a, an idea of like, you know, we believe in the Holy Spirit, God the Father, God the Son, God the mm -hmm. Holy Spirit. Here's aspects of the Holy Spirit. Let's look at John and then <laughs> he's the paraclete and he's all of these things. But no. He's alive and he's inside of us. Hmm. He's imparted spiritual gifts so that we might actually build up the body. So it should be that as I approach, and I'm going to say this because this is often best practiced. And Mark, Mark Clark um, highlighted this um, a couple of episodes ago, again, that in the church that we have our gifts, but we can't all operate them at the one time. So if you gift of hospitality, while I'm using the gift of teaching, well, well, pastor, I have a prophecy or hospitality. Do you know, I've cooked some, uh, you know, donuts and can I serve them to the church now? And I'm only point one of my sermon. It's not the place. Proper order is good. So for me, this is the beauty of pneumatology, meeting ecclesiology and just going. But I think this is the really important thing. The Holy Spirit is real. The Holy Spirit is alive. We've said this the whole, uh, before. The Holy Spirit doesn't make me weird. Mm. He makes me me. Mm. And I love this, that, that, the, that the spirit of the prophet is subject to them. Mm -hmm. So it's not this crazy ecstatic, oh, I couldn't control it. I just had to speak in tongues. And it was the spirit or I had to prophesy. No, you are in control of it. So I love the way that Paul says, the Holy Spirit is alive. He's in the church. But there is a God of order. But there should be an expectation. The, the, the verse that I keep coming back to, again, I believe that this is written in the NIV, okay? It says, <laughs> what then shall we say, brothers and sisters, when you come together, each of you, I love that, guy, girl, every single person in the church should come, okay? And uh, when you come together, each of you has a hymn, a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or interpretation. And obviously by inference here, a prophecy as well. Something that's spiritual, that's going to build up the life of the church. I always emphasize to people, gift of prophecy is not about me saying, you should go to Africa. I don't think it's the highly directional. I think it's more inspirational. It's going to build up your life. So for me, it's those two things. It's where pneumatology meets ecclesiology. And I would say to everyone, the church, your group shouldn't be boring. It should be alive 
And you know, look, look what I read in scripture today, mm -hmm. or I heard this song on Spotify. Could we try and sing it together? We don't have a guitar, so we have technology today. We can do this. They just should be alive with the spirit of God so that when we come in, let's be honest, sometimes from our mundane lives and we meet together with the promise of Jesus where two or three are gathered, I'm gonna be in the midst with my Holy Spirit. Well, this excites me now to go to church. So good. Okay, diving into application. <laughs> My application. Okay, I want to get into. Um, I want to get into how do people know their Bible so well that they can get to the place where they can be okay with the controversy and those harder questions. Mm. So, how do you, as an as a pastor, Andrew? What resources do you use? Are there websites? Are there books where you go and you say, I've, I've hit a thorny Bible question. Sure. I just read that I as a woman am not allowed to speak um, or whatever it might be. Where do you go? Yeah, well, o often what I what I try to do, being, uh, Dean, I mean, I'm sitting here and I've got on my iPad uh, a basic study Bible that just helps. I, I've always liked the a New International Version and I read other versions as well and refer to other versions, the versions that you were talking about. But I have this here always as, even when I'm reading scripture myself, mm -hmm. because even as a pastor for many times, you know, I've read the Bible cover to cover. There's still bits where I go, what does he mean by that? What what are they getting at? And first point, I always just go NIV, study Bible. I look at the footnotes and it just helps me. Then after that, do you know what? This day, it used to be different years ago. I would go always to a commentary. I mm -hmm. would always go to a commentary. And it, that was a physical book on the shelf. Sometimes I didn't have it. I would need to go to the shop, not Amazon. That was back in the day. So I have a whole bunch of commentaries. They're not in my home. They're in my office. Often when it comes to study, what I do is I pack them in my bag, I go into my office, because you don't get peace here to study. Mm -hmm. I bring them home, shut the door, go in the room and read it. Actually, I love that. Mm -hmm. I love the fun of that. I love the smell of the book, you know, and, and doing that and, and having the fun with it. But I think it's important as well. It's not just one commentary. Mm -hmm. It is a range of commentaries. I think it's actually what part of what Paul said here in 1 Corinthians, mm -hmm. that we have the right to judge. Mm -hmm. Now, we're not judging Scripture, but we are looking for the correct interpretation mm -hmm. of Scripture. So it is Scripture. We're not going to go, it should be thrown out. But actually, how do I correctly interpret this? Yes. So I try to get um, passages, or sorry, commentaries, but, but a, a variety of them to go, oh... Because sometimes, like all of us, people come with their own experience, their own background, their own leaning, their own culture. Yes. You know, so one guy that recently I have found to be so much help on studying the Gospels, Kenneth E. Bailey, mm -hmm. and his stuff. To, he was a guy that lived in that culture for year after mm -hmm. year after year. And culturally, he's immersed in it. And obviously, he's a scholar as well. So he's brought insights to scripture where I just go, that's absolutely amazing. So things like that. Uh, but you know what? Sometimes I just do a cheeky Google and <laughs> NT write, <laughs> NT write on, yes. and I'll put the passage in, etc. And of all and I, I recommend people, um, NT write stuff. He, he we, we've had him on uh, some of our interviews before. He's incredible. For me, he's probably the foremost authority in the New Testament today. Mm -hmm. Um, not that he's right in everything, but he probably is. Um, but uh, he 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 has his uh, books uh, that he's written by N.T. Wright, but a lot of his commentaries is like Hebrews for Everyone by Tom Wright. Okay, mm -hmm. so you know if you his formal N.T. Wright, his accessible stuff is Tom Wright. So I always. And another one that I've always loved over the years, although I don't agree with him at everything, mm -hmm. and sometimes his view of the supernatural is uh, William Barclay. Mm -hmm. William Barclay for many years, I'm not saying he was the highest academic, he was an academic, obviously, but his cultural analysis and insight to biblical life at that time was par excellence. So good. Even I was reading Barclay for this, and yes. then I read Fee for yes. this with the editor of the NIV. Um, yeah up until a while ago. And man, just such different takes on the passages. Yeah. And what I love about what you're saying is, you know, when you read a commentary, you're not reading what the Bible says. Yes. You're reading what a person says the Bible says. And that's mm -hmm. why it's so good to get yeah. so many people involved in that conversation. Because I, as Dina, I don't have a lock on what scripture says. 
other people hopefully can help illuminate what God is saying. So paying yeah. attention to the way that God teaches other people and bringing those pieces together hopefully gives us a clear understanding. Yeah. My yeah. last my last tip on okay, what come to on, do, do it. with really challenging passages. Yes to the commentaries, careful with the uh, Google searches, but yes to that. Yeah. I think just getting out an old fashioned um, piece of paper and a pen, mm. I just used to for years, the back of my Bible, so now like a note on my phone, I just kept a list of questions and passages that I found really troubling, really convicting, really challenging, things that I thought, okay, this doesn't really agree with God's character. I would just write the question wow, down and I would return to it from time to time. And as I read scripture and I read scripture, it was so faith building to see how many questions God answered just mm -hmm. through the course of reading his word. So when I read 1 Corinthians 14 and I come up with this question, don't freak out, mm. write the question down, ask God in due time to answer that question. And I think you will be so amazed at how God, as, as you read his word, he begins to speak to you in broader terms, the answer to that question that you wrote down. Not all of my questions have been answered, yeah. but a lot of my questions that I've written down when I've came, come across hard passages have been answered. Yeah. And I think that discipline of actually noting it was a key practice for me. That's great. A couple of things I would say as well as, as, we, as we wind this episode up is, that as you come to this, and we said this before, there's there are great Christians that hold different opinions on these things, but we will spend eternity together. Mm -hmm. And and I encourage people, don't fall out, don't spend, even if we've said something in this study, when you go, I can't believe, la, 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 you're gonna spend eternity with us, okay? <laughs> you're gonna be with us forever. We have a high view of scripture. We're wrestling with complex passages that people have been wrestling with for centuries. And I don't think we'll have the ultimate wisdom on these things until we are with the Lord himself. So this is important. We've had um, in, in history, in the history of the church, and there's like about 40,000 different denominations, uh, Protestant denominations in the world today. It's crazy people. And we normally like split on the very issue and become Baptists over one issue. And you imagine there's a group of people, we love you Baptists by the way, but it's over one issue that we can, Presbyterians over an idea of eldership and governance in the church. Methodists, they were known because of the method that they took. All I'm saying to you is be very, very careful in how you respect someone that has a different opinion for you. And then second, lastly, I'm going to say, be practical. Look at the beginning of the chapter. Follow the way of love. That's a command. And what? Eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit. That's an onus on all of us. I, I'm challenged by this so often, Dina. You know, it's just not, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna find out what the scripture says. No, I'm gonna find, I'm gonna do what the scripture commands. Mm -hmm. It's not understanding this, it's implementing it. And look at the way it ends up, verse 39. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy. Be like actually go after this stuff. Earnestly desire the end of chapter 12. Let me get to this one really quick here. Now eagerly desire the greater gifts of chapter 31, verse 12. So these gifts of the Spirit aren't passive things. They're actually something I think we need some action behind them mm -hmm. uh, and for us to go after and go, God, I've got one life and your Holy Spirit is alive. He wants to equip me so I can build up the church. So for me, that's, wow, go do it. Get after it. Be eager. Love it. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us. You know what to do. Like, share, subscribe. Um, all the previous chapters are available online and we're going to be coming up with the greatest chapter on the resurrection of Christ, the proof of our faith. If it's not true, let's go home. It is true, everyone. Let's believe it. First Corinthians 15 is coming.